Well, it's UFC's final event here of 2022, and it's from the UFC Apex in the main event. We've got the Killer Gorilla, Jared Cannonier, taking on Sean Strickland. It's number two versus number seven here in the middleweight division. We've got 14 fights in this card. The co-main event, a huge one. Armand Sukian taking on Demir Ismagulov. Also, some big-name fighters on this card as well. Amir Albazi, Alex Caceres, Julian Arosa, Drew Dober, Bobby Green, amongst others. It's a good 14-fight card from the UFC Apex. Uh, you know, the pay-per-view just ended. Jan Blakovic, Magomedov, Uncle Live go to a draw, and my goodness, all of a sudden, Jamal Hill's fighting Glover Teixeira for the world championship in Brazil. I like the fight. I think Magomed gets kind of screwed a little bit here, but we'll take it. Glover and Jamal Hill will be fighting for a world championship in about three weeks' time, or actually four weeks' time. Um, but folks, before we end the video, make sure that subscribe button down below for some more UFC here on the channel. So our first fight of the night will be Sergey Morozov taking on Journey Newsom. For Journey Newsom, just picked up his first one in the UFC in his last fight. It's a unanimous decision victory over Fernie Garcia. I thought Fernie Garcia was going to be able to pick up the win, but, uh, you know, it's a decision win for Newsom going into that one obviously for Garcia as well now 0-2 in the UFC but Newsom now 1-2 with that win over Garcia comes in there UFC 274 again just a dominant performance from just outstrikes Fernie Garcia picks up the win I'm um, on the scorecards before that though for Newsom lost to Randy Costa before that got a uh, head kicked in the face lost that fight in 40 seconds and his first fight in the UFC was a loss to Ricardo Hamos um, back in Minnesota in June of 2019 for his opponent though in Sergey Morozov Morozov's 2-2 two two in the promotion now he comes into the UFC tough fight right away they give him Umar Nurmagomedov. He's a plus 400 dog. Of course, he loses the fight. Nurmagomedov comes in there and he submits him in the second. Turns it around, picks up a win over Kalitaha in his next one. Morozov really using the wrestling to his advantage in that fight, picking up a win by unanimous decision. And then we thought he'd go in, in there um, after that and beat Douglas Silva de Andraj. But De Silva, such a tough fire to beat, man. I mean, De Silva goes in there, knocks down Morozov three times in the span of eight minutes, ends up picking up a Rene Gachuk victory in the second round and wins fight the night at UFC 271 in Houston. But it's a big win for De Silva. The Morozov, most notably, most recently turns it around picks up a huge unanimous decision victory over Halle and Paiva on the Sarukian Gamrock card in the apex in the summer of this year so Morozov coming off that victory I mean you know he can come in there he can put the wrestling boots on if he has to but then when you look at the fight against Paiva you know of course the second round was a lot of wrestling out of Morozov but the first and third was Morozov going there striking with Paiva even though he did lose that first round he bounces back in rounds two and three wins up ends up winning that fight by unanimous decision so Morozov now taking on Newsom. I think if Sergey is able to go in there and just get some takedowns he should be able to win the fight that way I mean you saw Newsom have a little bit of trouble with the wrestling of Ricardo Hamos but again that was like three years ago Newsom obviously in his last fight you know kept the fight standing for the most part um but I think Morozov on the feet should have a you know should have an advantage over Junior Newsom and obviously wrestling and grappling wise I think he's better than Junior Newsom as well all around I think Morozov's a better fighter he's a minus 240 favorite in this one both guys 33 years of age Morozov's a huge favorite for a reason I think he should be able to win I'm going to take Sergey Morozov to get back or to have back-to-back -back wins here in the UFC picking up a unanimous decision victory over Junior Newsom okay so yeah why a top 10 flyweight fight is the second fight of the card I don't understand. Um, we've got Manel Kopp, the star boy, taking on David Dvorak. Um, for Dvorak, man, comes in the UFC, wins his first three fights. Now, I feel like those wins are a little bit overrated now. I mean, I mean, they just kind of are. I see, okay, before the Mateus Nikolaou fight, I was really high on David Dvorak, but like, really when you take a deep dive into these three fights, they're good wins, don't get me wrong, but like Bruno Silva, no longer in the UFC, Jordan Espinosa, no longer in the UFC, Juan Camilo Ronderos, I believe is, yeah, he's still in promotion, he's gonna be fighting Clayton Carpenter um, next year, but like, you know, Juan Camilo Ronderos is 4-0, or 4-1 now, and Dvorak, you know, picked the bones, went in there, submitted him in the first round through a naked choke, Dvorak after that fights Mateus Nicolau, now at the time, I wasn't all that high on Nicolau, I think Nicolau, I thought Nicolau got lucky against Cop because I didn't really think he won the fight, but now I'm starting to acknowledge Mateus Nicolau as really a top five fighter in this weight class and as a serious title threat now that he is, what, 4-0 in his second round in the UFC. The win over Matt Schnell is telling, even though, again, I went into that Matt Schnell fight with Nicolau saying, okay, well, he just fought three months ago and he took a crap ton of damage against Sumadarji, but he's going to fight anyway. I thought Nicolau was going to win the second round. He did. That's besides the point, but Dvorak is now back, taking on Manel Kopp. Now, we look at Dvorak's win before the Nicolau loss. It's the big one over Silva, outstrikes him. He outstrikes Jordan Espinosa. Though a Ronderos fight, he takes him down and subs him right away. But there was a you know, a pretty clear pathway to victory for a guy who is a top 15 fighter in Dvorak against an entry-level guy in Ronderos. Now, he's going to be taking on the former Ryzen champion in Manel Kopp. And I've been huge on Manel Kopp. I really have. I will still make the case this guy should be 3-1 in the UFC. And again, I've again I've acknowledged Mateus Nicolau's rise and ascent to the top of the weight class. But I still think Kopp won that fight. 
His first fight in the promotion is the, pa the Pantoja fight. I get it. I get the loss. But the Ode Osborne one's huge. The big flying knee victory. And the Zhang Glass Jumagulov fight. He knocks him out in the first round. Now, Jumagulov now retired from the sport after, I mean, my goodness, just the horrible decisions with Jeff Molina and Charles Johnson back to back for him. Sucks to see him go. But now Cop went in there. Knocked out Zhang Glass Jumagulov. No controversy in that one. And now Cop will be fighting David Dvorak. I think Cop's way faster on the feet. I think, you know, wrestling wise, I don't really think this fight's going to end up down there because Dvorak has not landed one yet yet in his career. Of course, he got, uh, you know, Ronderos down, but Dvorak has not still successfully landed a takedown in the UFC. Manel Kopp's got like two, I think he got in the Pantoja fight. It's going to be a stand-up fight, but this is what I, you know, you, you look at Dvorak and Kopp's striking, striking skills. All right, maybe Dvorak is a, like a little bit more technical, but speed-wise, all Manel Kopp. Power-wise, all Manel, all Manel Kopp. It's not close. Like, just... Pure stand-up wise, Manel Kopp is the better striker. The only way I see David Dvorak winning this fight is if Dvorak can technically outstrike Manel Kopp for 15 minutes. I don't see it happening though. I mean, again, I think Kopp's way more explosive. I think he's gonna beat Dvorak to the punch every single time. And I'm gonna take the star boy, Manel Kopp, to go in there. I think he's gonna pick up another first round knockout here. I think he's gonna go in there. I think he'll blitz David Dvorak. I don't think Dvorak's gonna be able to get going in this fight. And I really think Manel Kopp's gonna show why he is truly a top five fighter in this weight class. Again, it's a shame it's the second fight of the card, but give me the star boy. Manel Kopp to knock out David Dvorak, first on KO finish for Kopp. So yeah, this one's interesting. You got Brian Battle on short notice taking on Hanat Fakatinov because uh, Fakatinov was supposed to take on Michael Morales and now Battle's coming in here on very short notice, like a week's notice to come in here and take this fight at 170 pounds. Of course, you know, Battle goes down after winning the Ultimate Fighter at 180, 185 pounds. He beats Urbina, he beats Treshawn Gore. He goes down to 70 though, to take on Takashi Sato and he'll, and, you know, he beats him, knocks him out in the first round, um, head kick knockout. But now he's coming back real short notice to take on Hanat Fakatinov and it's, a, it's at 170 pounds. That's, you know, questionable, I think, for Battle, who is no longer, you know, crowning the, the Pooh Bear nickname. He is now Brian the Butcher Battle, which is good, I think. Um, but whatever, he's back and he's taking on Fokertinov here. And Fokertinov, of course, picked up his win in his first UFC fight over Andres Mikolitis. He went in there, put on his wrestling shoes and really just out-wrestled Mikolitis for 15 minutes. You got some 30-26s in there, 30-27 as well, but 13 minutes of control time in that fight for Hernan Fokertinov. And of course, he got his UFC contract by winning on that UAE Warriors and Eagle FC card. He went in there, knocked out Eric Spicely in the first round, former UFC. UFC fighter in Eric Spicely, and now he'll get Brian Battle. Now, Battle's been good so far in the UFC. He's been undefeated, right? Of course, he goes in there, beats Urbina, submits him in the second round. He beats Trey Sean Gore, really just puts it on Trey Sean Gore, and then in his last fight against Takashi Sato, doing something I didn't think he was really capable of. One, showing the knockout power, and two, showcasing the head kicks. I mean, Brian Battle, that was a really clean knockout finish over Takashi Sato, and I really like Brian Battle. I think he's a great fighter, and I you know, really like his potential in this weight class. It's just that I think this fight's very tough for him. I think it's very tough for him, the, the, the fact that he's taking this fight on short notice. Fakhartinov has been, you know, getting ready for a guy, Michael Morales, who is undefeated, a striker in Michael Morales as well. A guy who's, you know, he has a win over Adam Fuji. He's got a win over Trevin Giles. That fight gets canceled. Fakhartinov instead gets battled on short notice, who obviously he's going to have to worry about the stand-up game out of Brian Battle too. But let's be honest, though. Michael Morales' striking game is better than Brian Battle's is. And for Fakhartinov, you're taking on a guy who, again, who has not been in camp, if you can come in there, really just out scramble him and outpace him on the ground, it will be tough for Brian Battle to keep up. And so that's why, as much as I like Brian Battle, and I've really picked Brian Battle in pretty much every single fight he's been in so far, I'm going to take Hernat, Hernat Fakhartinov here. I think Fakhartinov is able to go in there, really just out scramble Brian Battle in this fight. I don't think he's going to play too many games in the feet because Battle's striking game has shown a lot of you know improvement in his last two fights. But I think on the ground here, if Fakhartinov can really drag Brian Battle into deep waters, which I think he's going to have to do if he's going to win this fight, it's going to be a long night for Battle. Because again, Battle has not been really training for this. He takes this fight. I mean, by its by fight night, he's going to take this on, what, like 10 days notice? Because um, I believe, yeah, this fight just got booked a couple days ago. I don't even have the odds just yet. Fakhartinov is going to go in there. He's going to outpace and he's going to outscramble the former Ultimate Fighter um, in Brian Battle. So I'm going to take Hanat Fakhartinov to win his second fight in the UFC. I think just his pace and his cardio is going to be too much to, against Battle on short notice. So it's going to be Fakhartinov to win this one. He'll get it done by unanimous decision. Next up, we've got the second UFC outing for Mahashet. He'll be taking on Hafa Garcia in this one. I think this fight... You know, it's not an easy one to pick, but I think it's an easy one to break down. I think this is, you know, Hafa Garcia is obviously the wrestler, the grappler. I would say more of a grappler in this fight. And Mahashet's obviously going to be the striker in this fight. He's going to be looking to, you know, knock Garcia's head off because when you look at Mahashet's first fight in the UFC, it's over in Singapore. Big win. Only takes him, what, you know, a minute and 14 seconds. He comes in there, catches Steve Garcia 
right across the chin, counter right hook, puts him down. Garcia face plants right in the ground. He picks up the win over on that Teixeira Prohoshka card. Mahashets, you know, first win in the UFC, first fight in the UFC, goes well, first round knockout. Of course, he gets a shot in the UFC after winning the, on the Contender Series. He is a plus 475 dog in his fight in the Contender in 2021. He wins the fight. It's a very close fight, but when you look at that fight, Mahashet drops the first, he wins the next two, he gets his UFC contract. Now, he'll be taking on Hoffa Garcia, and Garcia is a fighter who started his UFC run 0-2, lost to Nasrat Hakparas and Chris Gritzmacher, but after that, he turns it around. He beats Natan Levy by unanimous decision. Then he goes on to go on and beat Jesse Ronson. He subs Ronson um, in the second round with the rear naked choke. And then most recently, he took on Dakar Close. It's a fight where he does eat some damage in. It's over in Dallas. Peña Nunez, too. He loses the fight to Dakar Close. But honestly, it was, no pun intended, a closer fight than I thought it was going to be. Garcia goes in there. He wins the second round by out scrambling and out wrestling and out positioning Dakar Close. Close, though, wins one and three to end up winning the fight. Really, that third round, Dakar Close starts to put it on Harford, Harford Garcia. But I was just surprised how well Garcia did do in that fight. But obviously with this fight between Garcia and Mahashet, he's going to have to be able to land some takedowns. He's going to have to be able to put the pressure on Mahashet and not let Mahashet, you know, do what he did basically to Steve Garcia. He's going to have to weather the storm. Does Garcia, if he's going to have to win, if he does want to win this fight, because you know, you know, the striking advantage is not going to be in his favor in this one. But again, I do not know how good of a ground, ground game truly Mahashet does have. You look at his fights outside the UFC. He fought in WLF Wars, and you know the competition there is very bad. Let's be honest with ourselves. He did not. He has not fought a fighter with a winning record until he fought in the Contender Series. I mean, all the guys he fought in WLF Wars, you're looking at one and three, three and one, zero oh and one, eleven and twelve, zero oh and zero, oh, zero oh and two, ten and fifteen, zero oh and three. You know, he got his shot in the contender series after beating Damu Wu, a fighter who's 0-3 at the time, which of course Mahashet goes in there, knocks him out in a minute. This guy now, though, Damu Wu is one and seven. Right? You just don't know how good the competition's been so far for Mahashet. And even a guy like Steve Garcia, sure, he beats a UFC level guy in Garcia. But let's be honest, Garcia's not the best UFC fighter, but if we are being honest with ourselves, he just did beat Chase Hooper. Now, striking, outstriking Chase Hooper and knocking him out is not the hardest thing to do, considering Hooper sometimes does block punches with his face. But still, it's a good one for Garcia. I think Mahashet's going to win this fight. I think he's, if he's able to keep this fight standing, he should be able to find that big power shot and knock down Garcia and put him down and put him out. Um, so if we're picking my high shot here, I'm taking him by knockout. Like I think if this fight does go in the later stages of this fight, I wouldn't feel as confident because then you're picking my high shot to keep the fight standing and really fight off a lot of the takedown game that Hoffa Garcia will bring. So I'm going to take my high shot. I think he's going to be able to kind of just pull off a replica in some regards. Um, like his fighting against Steve Garcia. I think he's going to really go in there. I think he's going to put it on Garcia early. Um, I'm going to take Mahashet to knock out Hoffa Garcia in the first round, improving to 2-0 in the UFC. And I'll be honest, I'm really surprised you're getting Saeed and your off a minus 120 here. I'll be honest. Like, I like Saeed Jakub Karamov. I think he's a good fighter. Um, but man, you know, Saeed and your Magomedov. 16 and 2. I know he's got the last Honey Barcellus on there, but really, after that Barcellus fight, it has been just one way traffic for Saeed Nurmagomedov. I mean, you got the Doug Douglas Silva de Andrade fight, wins by unanimous decision. The Cody Stamen fight, he goes in there. Guillotine choke immediately puts him away. The Mark Striegel fight. I know Mark Striegel's on the top UFC fighter, obviously, no longer in the promotion, but he knocks out Striegel in 50 seconds. Saeed Nurmagomedov is very good. He offers a lot, and we talk about this really every time Saeed fights. Saeed is not one of these typical Dagestani guys. I know he does not fight out of that, you know, that main gym, obviously, in Dagestan. Um, but, you know, he will throw a lot of spinning kicks. He will throw a lot of different stuff at you. Yeah, he can wrestle too, but he will he will strike with you. He will just offer up some unique stuff. And I think it's it's just a tough fight. Saeed Nurmagomedov is a tough fight for anybody. Now, he's going to be taking on Saeed Jakub Karamov here. And for Karamov, back-to-back -back wins in his first two fights in the UFC. The Ronnie Lawrence one's huge. I mean, because really... Saeed Jakub Karamov puts it on Lawrence, and it's really just, it is a dominant wrestling performance to kick off the Dosanya's Fazeev card. Karamov with 12 and a half minutes of um, control time in that fight. You know, Karamov really just puts it on Lawrence in the, in the wrestling game in that fight. Doesn't let Ronnie Lawrence really do anything, and Ronnie Lawrence is a good fighter. Like, that was the first time. No one's done that to Lawrence. You know, Lawrence was supposed to take on Cameron Simon. You know, just most recently, of course, Simon ended up getting uh, Kossel instead. He won the fight, but, you know, Ronnie Lawrence was an undefeated UFC fighter until he got Saeed Jakub Karamov, and Karamov really, you know, out-wrestles him and out-scrambles him, and that's going to be interesting here, because really, you don't see fights where, I know we're really just appealing to the last name at this point here, but really, you do not see fights where the Nurmago Madoff fighter is the less superior grappler and less superior wrestler, because Saeed Jakub Karamov is going to try to pressure and put down Saeed Nurmagomedov wrestling. 
And Sayinir Magomedov is going to be trying to disengage. He's going to be trying to, you know, he's going to try to strike Karim off. Because that's where Sayinir Magomedov's got the best advantage in this fight. It's going to be in the striking realm in this fight. I mean, I think his kickboxing is so much better than Karimov. Karimov really just uses his strikes to close distance. I hate to make a comparison here to Bilal Muhammad, but I feel like it it's not in that same degree. But it's kind of... I. Kind of. Because Karmov's always trying to close distance. He's always trying to push his opponent basically against the fence and try to out-wrestle him. I know he got out-wrestled in the first round of his fight against Trevin Jones. And Trevin Jones is having a lot of success against Karmov. And that's why I picked Ronnie Lawrence to beat Karmov. Because, okay, yeah, he beats Trevin Jones and he get, catches him with a guillotine with 20 seconds left. But he was on his way to lose the fight. Trevin Jones wins those first two rounds. And, you know, I don't think Trevin Jones is bad. But I don't think he's going to be the greatest fighter ever. Like, I mean, he just lost to Honey Barshel. He's on a three-fight losing streak. I think Jones out the UFC now, if I'm not mistaken. And Karmov, let's be honest, had some trouble with him early, but that was Karmov on short notice. Now he's really settled in. He goes in there in the Lawrence fight and he just out wrestles Lawrence for 15 minutes. Um, 10 takedowns and all in that fight. Is he going to be able to take down Sayyid Nurmagomedov? Because that's the thing. Nurmagomedov can strike and he can defensively wrestle. You know, he doesn't really shoot him for more, much takedowns in his own, right? I mean, really, I think he's only taking down Douglas Silva de Andrade. He took him down once. Didn't really do much with it because it was really De Silva was the one wrestling Saeed. So if De Silva is able to, you know, continuously take down Saeed Nurmagomedov, what is Saeed Jakub Karamov going to do? Because Karamov will find those opportunities and he will go for those opportunities in this fight. This is what makes this fight a real intriguing fight. And I know I said it, I opened with, okay, I'm surprised you're getting Saeed at minus 120 here because I still am surprised considering how good this guy has been. But I wouldn't be surprised if Karamov does pull off the upset here. Now, I'm still going to take Saeed Nurmagomedov. I think Nurmag Nurmagomedov will be able to work back up. I think he's going to get taken down a couple times in this fight, but I think he is going to be able to get back up to his feet. And I just think he has such a clear advantage striking wise that's going to make me pick Saeed Nurmagomedov in this fight. So I'm going to take Saeed to win this one by decision. I think his body work is going to be huge in this fight and I think Nurmagomedov is going to win. Give me Saeed Nurmagomedov to win this one by unanimous decision. So next up we have got Julian Marquez taking on Jerron Wynn. I made a little you know height discrepancy thing right there on the graphic. It's fine though. Uh, Marquez and Wynn here. So for Julian Marquez coming off that loss in his last fight it's a you know, tremendous back and forth fight. Well really it's kind of one-sided but Marquez does throw back in the three minutes that fight to take place in. Rodriguez and uh, Marquez, obviously, in San Antonio on the Cater and Emmett card. You know, Robocop picks up the win. He's a really good fighter. He knocks out Marquez. He knocked him down three times in the span of three minutes. He ends up winning the fight. Before that, for Marquez, he had the win over Sam Alvey. He does what he's supposed to do to Sam Alvey. He submits him in the second round. He has the fight against Maki Patolo, and we're going to talk about some of these Marquez fights. Really, the, th the stretch of three I want to talk about is Darren Stewart, Alessio DiCidico, and Maki Patolo. Now, he wins two of those fights. He beats Darren Stewart. He chokes him out in the second round. That's only back in 2017, though. The fight against Maki Patolo, I feel like, is the most notable to this Duran win fight because Patolo takes him down five times. And Maki Patolo is well on his way to picking up a decision victory over Julian Marquez. It's on a pay-per-view, too. It's on a main card. UFC 258, they made you pay, they make you, they made you pay to watch this fight. But um, Patolo's taking down Marquez at will. He takes him down five times, takes, takes him down once in the first round, really just holds him down. Second round takes him down three times. Third round, he gets the takedown. Marquez gets back up though, catches him in an anaconda, submits him, wins the fight. Marquez was fishing for you know submissions that entire fight. Eventually he gets it in the third round. Eventually he does tap out Maki Patolo, but Patolo was winning the fight to that point. He had nine minutes of control time on the ground before Marquez sunk in that anaconda and ended up winning it, right? But that's still telling though, he gets taken down five times in the Patolo fight. He gets taken down four times in the Jachitico fight, which he loses by split decision, and Darren Stewart takes him down four times. What is the only thing Duran Wynn does exceptionally well in the UFC? Wrestle. That's about it. Because let's be honest with ourselves, Duran Wynn does not do many things all that well in the UFC. Now, obviously, Duran Wynn is a better fighter than I will ever be, but let's be honest with ourselves, he's 5'6", he's 185 pounds, he's in the wrong weight class. He should be fighting at 170 pounds. He cannot make 170 pounds, and he's going to be fighting at 185 again against a big guy in Marquez, right? Marquez is 6'2". Duran Wynn is 5'6". Like, Duran Wynn is so short for this weight class. Like, it looked weird when he fought Antonio Ahoyo. It's going to be that same exact thing, but the thing, the difference with Marquez and Ahoyo is Marquez, you know, Marquez can brawl with you. Marquez has power. Ahoyo really, you know deteriorates after the first couple minutes and of course he's no longer in the UFC he got knocked out by Joaquin Buckley but that was the you know the fight Jerron was able to win win no pun intended went in there 12 takedowns he's able to take down Ahoyo at will and he won the fight but his other fights in the UFC on you know, the Darren Stewart fight he took him down a lot 
didn't get the didn't get the decision nod. He was kind of like Danny Sabatello. He didn't you know really punch at all. He out wrestled him, but didn't do anything with his you know positioning. He loses to Gerald Mearshart. Mearshart submits him in the third. Let's be honest with ourselves. That's a very tough stylistic fight for win. And then Ahoyo, okay, beats him. And then he runs into Phil Hawes. That fight's just a massacre. He can't take down Phil Hawes. He goes in there. He's oh, he doesn't really, sh yeah, he isn't even shooting for a takedown because he can't close distance to get to Phil Hawes. And that's the problem I have with this fight for Duran Win. I don't think he's going to be able to close distance to get to Marquez. I think Marquez is going to keep his reach on him. You know, it's just I don't know what Win's going to be able to do in this fight. Because, you know, Duran went AKA zone. He's always, he's a wrestler. He's going to try to come in there. He's going to out scramble his opponent. He's going to try to. I don't think he's going to be able to do so against Marquez. If he does, I think there's a chance Marquez is going to submit him. Similar to what Jeremy Mearshart did. If Wynn puts himself in a bad position, in a vulnerable position on the ground, Marquez will be able to sink in a submission and maybe choke him out. Similar to what he did to Maki Patolo on the Usman Burns card. I think this fight just, you know, screams Julian Marquez. And I'm talking about the ground game. On the feet, it's all day Julian Marquez. And I don't even think Duran Wynn's going to get out the first round, if I'll be honest with you. I think Marquez is going to melt him. I think, really, all pressure was let out of the tires in Wynn's last fight. I think it's... It's going to be tough for him to come back. I know it's been six months, but I'm still, I'm taking Marquez in one-sided domination here. Give me the Cuban Missile Crisis, Julian Marquez, to go in there. Knock out Duran, win in the first round. Give me Marquez. Next up, we have got Jake Matthews taking on Matt. Some of the Jedi assembles burger in this one. So for Jake Matthews, coming off a huge win in his last fight over Andre Fialo. He comes in there. He knocks out Fialo in the second round. Big right cross puts him away at UFC 275. And really just taking all the hype away from Fialo at the time. Because if you remember, Andre Fialo going into that one had two back-to-back -back, uh, knockout wins in the first round over the likes of Miguel Baeza and Cameron Van Camp. Obviously, after that, Fialo loses to Matthews. And then most notably, most recently, losing to Muslim Salikov. But... It's a huge win for Jake Matthews, who looks really good in that fight. And really, he's just, he was coming off the loss of Sean Brady, which isn't a bad loss. Obviously, you know how good Sean Brady is. He lost, of course, to Bilal Muhammad, most notably. But Sean Brady's a good fighter. He's 14-1. But you, like, the Jake Matthews fight against Diego Sanchez was a little bit underwhelming. It was very underwhelming. He beats Diego Sanchez, but he goes the full 15 with an old Diego Sanchez. He beats Amel Mech. He has some fights where, like, sure, he's winning, but it's nothing that you're going to go home talking about. But really, that Jake Matthews-Andre Fiala win, that's a huge one for Matthews. That was something people were talking about. That was a knockout of the night for uh, Matthews. And really his best one, I would say, since he beat Li Jing Liang all the way back in 2018. Now, his opponent in Matt Semmelsberger here, he's a tough guy to put away. And that's why I think it's going to be tough for Matthews if he's going to win this fight to even get a finish. Because Semmelsberger, I mean, last time he was finished was back in 2018, which actually isn't all that long ago. But still, career-wise for Semmelsberger, it's a long time ago. He has had, a, like, 13 fights since that one loss to Jerome Featherstone, who was making his promotion or his MMA debut back then. The guy's 4-1. Really never took off after being Semmelsberger. But for Semi the Jedi, comes in the UFC, beats Carlton Mines by decision. He knocks out Jason Wood in 16 seconds, loses to Chaos Williams after that by decision, beats Martin Sano, who, I mean, obviously beats, beats Martin Sano, beats AJ Fletcher, and then after that loses to Alex Morono by decision. Obviously, Morono just got finished by um, Santiago Ponce to be on the, on the pay view card just a couple minutes ago, a couple hours ago from when I'm recording this. But I mean, here from Semmelsberger and Matthews, should be a good fight. I think you're going to see both these guys really exchange leather. I think you're going to see just both these guys trading on the feet. I think it's going to be tough to get a finish either way in this fight. I think both these guys have pretty solid shins. I mean, you know, the power advantage is tough because both these guys do have a lot of power. You just saw Matthews go in there and, uh, and finish Fiala. You've seen Semmelsberger get 15 and 16 second knockouts over the likes of Jason Witten. Martin Sano is not very good, but still, you know he's got the power. Again, Two very good strikers going to go out there. I doubt you're going to see much grappling in this one. I mean, Semi the Jedi is 100% so far in his takedowns in the UFC, but it's one against Morono and it's two against Carlton Minus. For Jake Matthews, he doesn't really shoot takedowns all that often because he's really just trying to go in there and stand and bang. If we get the Jake Matthews, though, that we got in his last fight, it's going to be a tough night in the office for Matt Semmelsberger. But I don't think Matthews is going to be able to get a finish. I'm going to take Jake Matthews in this one. Um, but... I don't know if he's going to be able to finish, be able to finish Semmelsberger just because, again, I've seen Semmelsberger out there fight some really tough guys. Like, he's gone the distance against Chaos Williams and Alex Moreno. Those two guys hit hard. So, I'm still going to take Matthews to win. I don't think he's going to be able to get the finish, but at minus 240, I'm going to take Matthews to beat some of the Jedi. Give me him by unanimous decision. Next up, we have got Cheyenne Flissmas taking on Corey McKenna. Uh, the graphic's wrong. Flissmas is 2-1 in the UFC. I kind of forgot about her loss against Montserrat Conejo in her first fight in the promotion, but since then, the two wins do come with a huge 
huge knockout finish over Gloria De Paula in her second fight in the UFC on the Hall Strickland card. I mean, you know, De Paula's, you know, Vlispas takes her down as De, De Paula is getting up. Vlispas catches her right on the chin with a big head kick, puts her down, and wins the fight. And then after that, Vlispas, she goes in there, beats Mallory Martin. She wins fight of the night on that Fon Aldo card. It's been a year, but she really goes in there, gets into Mallory Martin's face, and beats her by decision. Cheyenne Vispas is a good fighter. She's a really good fighter. She's a dog in there. She'll go in there. She will get in your face. She will talk to you and she will, you know, continue striking. She does not want to wrestle. Obviously, you saw that in the Kinejo fight. I don't think Corey McCann is going to be the fighter that's going to really offer her that. I mean, I think McCann will shoot for takedowns like she did in her last fight against Miranda Granger and even Elise Reed. She landed takedowns in both those fights. Obviously, she just submitted Miranda Granger with a Von Flew choke at 23 years of age. That's huge. But I don't think McCain is going to be able to keep Vlismas down and that might be a little bit telling in my prediction here but I don't I don't know if McCain is going to be able to fire be able to do the be able to be the fighter that can do that to Vlismas now I think Corey McCann is good I, I think she's really good for her age she's only 23 years old she's already two and one in the UFC given her first one I think she's lost I think Kay Hansen beat her but that's fine McCain though again for her age is very good she beats Vanessa Demopoulos on the Contender Series, and Vanessa Demopoulos now, I mean, obviously, I didn't think she was going to find the success she's had in the UFC after she lost to McKenna on the Contender, and even when she got signed and lost to JJ Aldridge, but don't look now, Vanessa Demopoulos is 3-1 in the UFC, so she's doing pretty well for herself. McKenna beat her originally to get into the UFC at 21 years of age, and now here she is after wins, you know, over Kay Hansen in a big Von Flew choke victory over Miranda Granger. My thing about McKenna in this fighting is Cheyenne Vlismas. I feel like it's a little bit too soon. I think McKenna's good. I think let's not forget she's 23 years old. She has not been in the sport for very long, but I just feel like this is a little too soon for Corey McKenna. This is a tough stylistic matchup for her. Cheyenne Vlismas is really good. I like. I, th I think very highly of Vlismas. I think since that Kinejo fight, she has made the adjustments necessary. Obviously, I don't think, you know, her wrestling hasn't been tested too much, but Mallory Martin, is a fighter who, um, you know, she does wrestle and she is trying to go in there. She's going to try to out wrestle you. Mallory Martin could not take down Cheyenne Vlismas. Cheyenne Vlismas stuffed her on every single takedown. Martin went 0 for 5. Now, we'll see. Like, is McKenna a better wrestler than Mallory Martin? I think she is, but let's be honest with ourselves. That's really all that Mallory Martin does do. And Vlismas was able to weather the storm throughout that entire fight. I don't think McKenna is going to be able to take down Vlismas. If she can't take down Vlismas, it is going to be a tough night for her on the feet. Because Cheyenne Vlismas is going to melt Corey McKenna on the feet. Corey McKenna got outstruck by Elise Reed, right? And I don't, I think Elise Reed's getting better. Don't get me wrong. Like Elise Reed, you know, I know she just, um, she lost to Sam Hughes, but she beat, beat Melissa Martinez. It's going to be an interesting fight next year when she takes on Loma Luponi. But again, Elise Reed goes in there and dominates McKenna on the feet. McKenna found a little bit of success in the ground. But when she's fighting Cheyenne Vlismas, it's going to be all Cheyenne Vlismas. Vlismas will not have too many problems, I think, really with um, McKenna. I think she's going to get in her face. I think she's going to talk to McKenna. She's going to melt McKenna. Um, I would be, you know, I don't think, obviously, Vlismas' knockout went over to De Palo, the one shot, the big kick knockout. It's not going to happen in every single one of her fights. Obviously, she has not possessed that power to repeat that fight in and fight out. I'm not, and I don't think we're going to see that in this fight, but I could potentially see a knockout finish for Vlismas in this fight. I think it would be late in this fight in the third. A TKO finish, basically just an accumulation of damage out of Cheyenne Vlismas, putting it on Corey McKenna. That could win her the fight that way. I don't think it's going to happen, but I mean, I really think this is one-way traffic for Vlismas here. This is, I very rarely say, and this fight's not a lock, and I'm not going to say it is, but I very rarely have this confidence on a female fight, but I have it in this one. I really think this fight stylistically, stylistically favors Cheyenne Vlismas a lot, and I take Corey McKenna in pretty much every single fight she's in. But give me Cheyenne Vlismas, she's going to go in there and she's going to completely dominate Corey McKenna in the striking, and I think she's going to be able to keep it standing throughout the entire fight as well. So give me Cheyenne Vlismas to win this fight. She's going to get it done by unanimous decision. Next up, we've got a middleweight fight between Cody Brundage and Michelle Ozil Shashek. For Cody Brundage, coming off that big win, or back-to-back -back wins, actually, um, as he starts his UFC career, losing to Nick Moximov, who's no longer in the promotion, but after that for Co uh, Cody Brundage, comes in there, beats Dolce Lujambula, submits it with a guillotine choke in the first round, given Lujambula no longer in the UFC. They kind of gave, um, of course, 
Edmund Shabazi in a layup, giving him Dasha Lujambula. Even though Lujambula didn't fight all that bad in that fight, but Shabazi and him out in the second, most recently last night. But for Cody Brundage, goes in there. Smith Dolce um, in the first round with the guillotine choke. Lujambula is doing well early against Brundage. He is landing. Eventually, though, a scramble ends up with Brundage having a Lujambula and a guillotine choke. He submits him. He picks up the win in the first round. After that, for Brundage, Goes in there in the Josanya and Vaziv card. Knocks out Treshawn Gore in the first round. Big win for Brundage showing, okay, he can get it done on the ground with the grappling, and he also get it done on the feet too with the power beating Gore. Now, given Lujian Bula and Gore aren't the best two fighters to beat. I mean, given, yeah, okay, Treshawn Gore obviously, you know, came in and he picked up a huge win over Josh Fremd in his last one. It's a good win for him, but let's still be honest with ourselves. Treshawn Gore is a very low level UFC fighter, at least at this point of his career. This, the guys only had five pro fights, and now Cody Brundage is going to go from that to Michelle Zolshechek. And Michelle Zolshechek is a guy who made his UFC debut back at UFC 219. That's all the way back in 2017. Cyborg home, the main event of that card. Habib Nurmagomedov was the co-main event against Edson Barbosa on that night. And Michelle Zolshechek had that fight, in, fight against Khalil Roundtree back then, but still, since then, for Ozil Shashek, and most recently for him, he's won three of his last four. Big wins over Sam Alvey, Shmil Gamzatov, and Modestus Bukowskis. Obviously, the Gamzatov win being the biggest one out of those three, I would say. But still, the Bukowskis wins a big one by precision as well. He loses to Dustin Jacoby, which is going to happen to you. Obviously, now with Ozil Shashek, down at 185 pounds, he was a minus 600 favorite going into the Sam Alvey fight. Now he's back at 185. Four fight against Brunage, in which he's a, you know, give or take around a minus 275 favorite and down to minus 265 now, I guess. But, um, you know, Ozil Shashek's good. His striking keeps on getting better by the by fight, really, I would say. Obviously, you can't take much of the Sam Alvey fight, but he put it on Sam Alvey in their fight in August. But again, that's what he's supposed to do, Sam Alvey. The Gamzatov one, I think, is a huge one, really. Because, I mean, he was an underdog going to that one. Gamzatov undefeated. He sits down Gamzatov with a uppercut. Excuse me, I'm still kind of sick. But, you know, puts down Gamzatov with an uppercut. Gives him his first loss. Obviously, Gamzatov is undefeated in PFL. He's undefeated, undefeated in World Series, ACB, and, you know, the UFC to that point. And now, we have not seen Gam Gamzatov since. He was booked against Misha Serkinov. But it's a huge win for Ozil Shashek. And I really think he's got the power to sit down Brundage. We will see how Brundage approaches this fight. I think we might see a wrestling heavy approach, but I think if that's the case, Ozil Shashek should be able to keep it standing. And if not, okay, I think Brundage will go in there and he will probably stand and bang with Ozil Shashek, which I don't think is going to work out that well for him. So I think Ozil Shashek's going to find him. I think he's going to, you know, find that spot. He's going to put down Brundage and I, Brundage and I think Ozil Shashek is going to win the fight. So it could be Michelle Ozil Shashek to pick up yet another one in the UFC. I think it's going to be another first round knockout. Give me Michelle Zolchacek again. First round knockout finish over Cody Brundage. Love this fight here. And if you've watched the channel before, I mean, my apologies if this pick's a little bit biased, but I will try to give you, an, again, an, a fair and honest prediction like I will when some of my faders, favorite fighters fight. I'm talking like, you know, the Colby Covingtons in the world, the Michael Chandlers of the world. Bobby Green's one of those guys. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson too. Kevin Holland. I mean, but I, I will give you a fair and honest prediction here. Bobby Green to Drew Dober, what a fight. I mean, I'm so excited for this one. Bobby King Green is back. He was supposed to take on Jim Miller in the summer. Fight didn't happen. Green failed a drug test, but now he's back at the end of the year taking on Drew Dober. Let's not forget the spot Bobby Green was in in his last fight. UFC main event, first one for Bobby King Green. Two weeks after beating Nasrat Hawkpross and probably the best win of his career, if not the second best win of his career when you look at the ally Quinto win before at hand. But still, Bobby Green goes in there in a number one contender's fight, lose to Islam Mahashev. Whatever, it's going to happen. But Bobby King Green is back. He's going to be taking on Drew Dober. And Drew Dober has been looking incredible recently as well. You look at back-to-back -back wins for him. A huge win over, you know, highly touted prospect Terrence McKinney. He goes in there. Dober gets, sit down immediate, gets sat down immediately. He survives the onslaught on the ground from McKinney. He comes back. He wins the fight all in the span of three minutes. It's a huge fight and a great fight on the Santos Anka Live card in March of this year. After that for Dober, though, he bounces back with another huge win. UFC 277. It's a win over MMA Masters his own in Rafael Alves. Crazy back and forth fight, but Dober sits him down in the third round. Huge win for Drew Dober. Big shot to the body, meaning perfectly placed um, hook by Drew Dober. Sits down Rafael Alves. He wins the fight. Now, Dober needed those two wins. He was coming off the back, coming off back to back losses to the likes of Islam Mahashev. Obviously, going to happen to you. And Brad Riddell, and a guy in Riddell who has not seen success as of late, man. I mean, after that Dober when he lost to Fazivi, he's not been the same, the same since really he got frozen up by that wheel kick by Fazivi. He loses to Jalen Turner after that, and he gets subbed by Hanato Moicano. Money Moicano in his last fight um, at UFC 281. But um, 
For Dober, he loses those two fights. He was coming off a three-fight winning streak before that. Wins for Polo Reyes, Nasser Hawk Pross, and Alexander Hernandez. But really, what you're going to see in this fight, you're going to see striking. You're going to see a back-and-forth fight in the feet between Drew Dober and Bobby Green, and I'm so excited. We are going to find out who the better striker is. Really, that is kind of the case in most Bobby King Green fights. They match him up with a lot of strikers. Obviously, they didn't in the Mahashev fight. But the fight I want to go back to is the Nasrat Hawkpross fight, man. Bobby Green is on point in that fight. 188 significant strikes for Bobby Green in that fight. 79 of them connected in the third round. 71 in the second, 30 in the first. Bobby Green put a pace on Nasrat Hawkpross in that fight. He was, you know, from... From bell to bell, man, Bobby Green put it on Hawk Prost. And you're going to see that in this Drew Dober fight. He is going to try to put it on Drew Dober as well. The difference between Dober, though, and some of these other guys Bobby Green's been fighting, I Quentin and Hawk Prost, is that Dober's got a lot more power. The power coming back at Bobby Green's going to be a lot more. But the thing about Bobby Green is Bobby Green doesn't really get hit all that much. Like, yeah, he can get in these fights with Hawk Prost, like where they're back and forth fights, but he still didn't get hit all that much in the Hawk Prost fight. And the fight I want to bring up, and I will bring this up every single time Bobby Green fights, is the fight against Rafael Fazeev. He beats Rafael Fazeev. Like, I do not want to hear it. Bobby Green wins that fight pretty handedly. I, I really think so. When you really go watch that fight back, Bobby Green turns it on and puts it on Fazeev in that third. I don't know how that fight was scored on one card 30-27. You can make the case that 30-27 should be in the other direction. Bobby Green has a tremendous fight against Fazeev in that one. Again, I get why Fazeev won, but I still score it for Bobby King Green. I am telling you, rewatch that fight. Tell me you don't score it for Bobby Green. He's a very good fighter. And fought, right, you know the power Rafael Fazeev's got, right? I mean, hell, Fazeev, after that Bobby Green fight, has gone in there and he's fought guys, ranked guys, and gotten finishes against the likes of Rodel Dos Anjos and even before the Bobby Green fight in Hanato Moicano, he has knocked out ranked fighters. Bobby Green survived three rounds and hell, I think Bobby Green beat Rafael Fazeev in a three round fight. That's how good this guy is. So when you look, go back to my original point about, okay, Drew Dober, sure, the power is going to be coming back at Bobby Green in this fight. It is, but you really going to say Drew Dober's got more power than Rafael Fazeev? Because I wouldn't. I don't think he does. So Bobby Green has been in there. He has seen the power coming back at him from the other side in a guy like Rafael Fazeev. And now I don't want to talk about the, the, the uh, Thiago Moises fight. I still think Bobby Green won that fight, but there's going to be no type of style of fight like that the, uh, Like that Thiago Moises fights, obviously coming back in this fight. Drew Dober will likely not shoot a takedown on Bobby Green in this fight. If he does, Bobby Green will probably stuff it. You're going to see a striking fight. And whatever Dober does throw, I think he will throw those big overhands. Bobby's probably just going to roll with them, though. You know, the classic shoulder roll that Bobby Green does always, he always presents at you, right? That's probably going to come into play here. And I think, I really think Bobby Green's going to find a lot of success in this fight. I just, again, it's whoever you think's got, I, well, the power, Drew Dober's got more power. Yes, Bobby Green can go, can go out there and he can get finishes like you did see in the Ally Quinta fight. But truly, and I love Bobby Green, but I think that was more of Ally Quinta being out of the sport and Green really melting him. Obviously, it was a really nice combo on um, that Green did land against Ally Quinta that sat him down. But, you know, Green's more of a guy who's going to go in there and he's going to, you know, I wouldn't say outpoint you because obviously Green's still trying to end fights, but he is going to go in there and he is going to try to put it on you for 15 straight minutes. And honestly, that's what I think he's going to do against Drew Dober. I mean, really, I think I think Dober will land a little bit on Green, but I just don't know how much, you know, what level of success he's going to have. Because if he can't knock out Green, which Bobby Green has a pretty solid chin, like you saw in the Fazeev fight, I mean, it was on display in that one. What is Dober going to be able to do? Because can, can, really, can Dober outstrike Bobby Green for 15 minutes? Think about that. Or can he do it for two rounds out the 15 or two rounds out the three? I don't think so. I'm taking Bobby Green. I really think Bobby Green's going to be able to go in there. I think the jab, the jab cross combo out of Green is very tough to beat. And I know he's 36 now, but still, I really do think Bobby Green is still one of these elite guys in the weight class. And I think he should be ranked. I think he should be in the top 10. I would take Bobby Green against some guys in the top 10. I mean, and I know how stacked this weight class is, but I take Bobby Green against a lot of good fighters in this weight class. I still, honest to God, would. Give me Bobby King Green, get him back in the top 15. He's going to, you know, at plus money, Bobby Green's going to go in there, beat Drew Dober. Give me Bobby Green by unanimous decision. Good fight coming up now. Alex Caceres take on Juicy J, Julian Arosa. And my goodness, does Julian Arosa keep winning fights? Like this guy, man, this latest run in the UFC from Julian Arosa, he keeps on building on it. I mean, he's won five out of his last six. The only hiccup coming in the loss to Sung Mu Choi back in 2021. But you look at the wins. Sean Woodson. I mean, he's a huge underdog. Comes in short notice UFC Apex, plus 350 dog. Comes in there, subs Woodson in the third round. 
He knocks out Nate Landwehr after that. He does have the fight against Sung Woo Choi, which he loses, which is fine. He subs Charles Air Jordan, who I think very highly of. I think Jordan's a really good fighter. He goes in there, he beats Jordan. Even I know Jordan just lost to Nathaniel Wood, but it's all right. He beats Steven Ojo Pearson after that by split decision. And then he beats Hakeem Dawadu after that, which the Dawadu win, man. Oh my goodness. Like, I really stopped picking against DeRosa, but I was like, okay, Dawadu's pretty good. I'm not going to pick against Dawadu here. No. Arosa goes in there and beats him by decision. Like he, you know, he out wrestles Dawadu when he needs to. He out strikes Dawadu pretty much throughout the entire fight. Julian Arosa's good, man. This guy wins every single round of the Dawadu fight. Now they book him against Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres. I like Caceres. You know, Caceres has been around the UFC for a while. Made his debut back on, you know, in 2011. The main event was was Noguera versus Phil Davis. Like, it was a long time ago. Anthony Johnson, the late, great Anthony Johnson, beat Dan Hardy on that card by decision. Like, it was a long time ago where Caceres made his UFC debut. I mean, the guy is 19 and 13 now professionally as a fighter, and they gave him a tough fight in his last fight. They give him Sodi Kusev. Super Sodi Kusev's a very good fighter. It's honestly a closer fight than I remembered it. Um, you know, rewatching it, obviously Yusef wins, but like you, you go rewatch it, Caceres has his moments. Like in the in the second and third round, Caceres stays competitive. Now I still think Yusef won every single round of that fight, but honest to God, you can make the case Caceres, I wouldn't say wins, but seals a round in that one, right? But now you get him against Julian Arosa, who Julian Arosa seriously should be looked at in the top 15 soon. This guy is again, he, he has turned it around. For Caceres, though, when you look at his wins. I know MMA, MMA, MMA math, oh my goodness, can I talk? Doesn't work like that, like this, but Caceres beat Sung Woo Choi back in 2021. Submits him with a huge rear naked choke. That was probably Caceres, one of his biggest wins to date that gets him in the top 15. While Junior, Julian Rosa did get knocked out by Sung Woo Choi. Caceres' win streak was huge, though. He goes on after losing to Crone Gracie in a co main event. He beats Steven Ocho Peterson. He beats Chase Super. He beats Austin Springer. Beats Kevin Kroom. Beats Sung Woo Choi. Given a lot of those fights were in the apex and they were against guys who really were making their UFC, UFC debut. If I recall, I think it was Springer made his UFC debut and Kevin Kroom. Still, though, he wins those fights. Gets Yusef loses by decision. In this fight though with Caceres and, and Julian Rosa, I as much as it pains me to say, because I'm a big fan of Alex Caceres, I think Julian Rosa's kind of gotten beat everywhere here. Let's be honest with ourselves. I think he does. On the ground, Arosa is better. On the feet, Arosa is better. The only where, the only place where I think Caceres has the advantage is in the chin, because I think Caceres can't eat a punch more than Arosa can. But both these guys have been in the, the octagon or been in the cage for a very long time. Again, Caceres is 19 and 13, Arosa is 28 and 9. I mean, power-wise, though, I give, her, I give it to Rosa. I think striking-wise, Rosa's better. I think he's quicker. Only thing Caceres hasn't beat really is in reach. And then on the ground, yeah, Caceres isn't horrible down there, and he's good defensively off his back, and he can create opportunities for himself to get submissions. But still, though, I'm taking a Rosa. I think Rosa's faster down there. I think he's better down there as a whole. I think it's just a very tough stylistic matchup for Alex Caceres. Obviously, he's always going to have that advantage with the reach just because he's a long, lanky fighter. But yeah, I still, I can't bring myself to pick Bruce Leroy here. I'm going to take Julian Arosa. I said a long time ago, I'm not, I'm going to stop doubting Julian Arosa. Again, I doubted him in the Dawadu fight. I'm not going to doubt him here against Bruce Leroy. Give me Julian Arosa to beat Alex Caceres. He's going to get it done by unanimous decision. So yeah, real interesting fight here. I mean, obviously, Amir Abazi taking on Alessandro Costa. Um, okay, so I'll tell you why this fight's happening and why we have a fight here with the number nine ranked, I think Elbazi is, seven. Um, at minus 435, you're taking on Costa, plus 350 coming back at you. Uh, Albazi was originally supposed to take on Alex Perez. Now, Alex Perez, like this guy, I mean, does he fight? Like, no, okay, yeah, the fighting is Pantoja, I guess. But I mean, you look at Alex Perez's topology page, he's got so many canceled fights. Albazi was yet another one. He's supposed to take on Kai Kara France in Australia in February. We'll see if that happens. It's supposed to be on the main card. Anyways, Albazi doesn't get Alex Perez. Instead, he's supposed to get the raw dog, Brandon Royval. Unfortunately for Everyone, I'm a big Brand Royval guy. Royval breaks his wrist, so that fight doesn't happen. Instead, we get Albazi taking on Alessandro Costa on short notice. Now, if you don't know who Alessandro Costa is, he's been fighting in Lux. He's the Lux flyweight champion. Um, he was the champion before he came into the Contender Series. He won the Contender Series, but did not receive a contract, so he came back to Lux. Ended up winning his last fight in 12 seconds over Carlos Gomez for the Lux Flyweight Championship. What I can say about the guy, he does have a lot of power for being a flyweight. Um, he isn't a bad grappler either. He does have some pretty good wrestling skills as well, and the jiu-jitsu game out of Costa is pretty good as well, and that's great and all. And I think Alessandro Costa is a very welcome addition to the flyweight division here in the UFC. My only thing is, though, like, okay, he's fighting Amir Albazi, though, and Amir Albazi is very good. 
Like, you look at what Albazi's done so far in the UFC. His first find the promotion. They give him Malcolm X Gordon. I believe he yeah, has both the, both those guys' debut going into that fight. Albazi wins. He subs him. It's in Abu Dhabi on the Figueiredo Benavides card. He subs him with a triangle choke in the first round. And they turn him around against Jean Glass Jumagulov. He basically just out wrestles Jumagulov and he outstrikes Jumagulov when it matters, too. It's not. I wouldn't say it's Albazi's best fight in the world because Juma Gulab does go in there and win the first round, but Albazi wins rounds two and three, wins the fight. I'll be honest with you, at the time, that was when a lot of people were very high on Jagos Juma Gulab, including myself. I took Juma Gulab to win that fight. He was coming off, you know, the loss to Paiva, but still he'd, you know, fight and fight nice globally. He had three straight wins. I keep, I bring this up every time Juma Gulab fights. I guess he's not anymore, but, you know, when he beat Tyson Nam, Tiger on Bekov, and Ali Bogantinov in three straight fights, you know, everyone thought Shuma Gulov was going to be a big time player in the weight class. Obviously, Albazi weathered the storm. He beat him by decision. And most recently for Albazi at UFC 278 in Utah, he goes in there and he subs Francisco Figueiredo in the first round. The guy's really good. I mean, Emi Albazi is that guy on the ground. He is very talented with his jiu-jitsu. He's a very talented wrestler as well. Amir Albazi is one of the elite guys that at this 125 pound weight class. And it's just a very tough entry fight for Alessandro Costa. It just, it is. Like how does Costa win? He's gonna have to catch Amir Albazi early because really, you know he doesn't have much time in this fight either considering short notice, albazi has been training for top five guys and Alex Perez, a, a former title challenger and a guy who should be on his way to fight for the championship in the next two years and Brandon Royval as well. You go from that to Costa, a guy who has not fought in the UFC just yet, just barely won in the contender series. He's knocking out guys who are six and three in Lux. Come on now. Like unless Costa can just put up, you know, unless Costa can land a bomb, he's gonna lose this fight. It's just that simple. Amir Albazi is gonna go in there. He's gonna take down Costa pretty easily and he's probably gonna submit him in the first round. That's where I'm going here. I think Albazi does his job against a guy who, you know, is making his UFC debut. So what a top 10 guy is supposed to do. Amir Albazi picks up the win, his fourth in the UFC, improving to 4 0. Amir Albazi wins by first round submission. Really like this fight in the Komen event. We have got Armand Sarukian taking on Demir Ismagulov here. What a fight we have. I mean, Armand Sarukian, 18 and 3 as a professional fighter, two losses in the UFC. They come to the likes of Islam Mahashev, the current champion, and Mateus Gamrot. There's no shame in losing the Gamrot fight. I. I kind of think Sarukian might have won that fight when you really go back and you watch it. I mean, you give the fourth round, obviously, to Sarukian. You give the first round to Sarukian as well. The rest of it's just razor thin. I would give the second to Sarukian too, and I think that's where he does win the fight. But again, I was not mad at the decision for Mateus Gamrot. Not at all. I think Gamrot's a very good fighter. And it's just, it's a really good back and forth fight. Obviously, Sarukian, he does win on the feet. Sarukian showed that he was a better striker in that fight, which I think was something... I mean, it was just, that was a tough fight to break down because you really didn't know how good either guy would be against each other. And Sarukian, again, he does win the feed against Gamrot. He knocks Gamrot down in the fourth round, but it was the wrestling out of Mateus Gamrot that won him some rounds. Really, you have some razor thin fights, you know, razor thin rounds in the feet, but in the end, Gamrot secures a takedown. He's got a minute of control time on the ground that pushes him over the top, obviously. Because Sarukian before that was just on a roll, man. I mean, you look at what he does when he comes in the UFC. He's got that razor thin fight against Islam Mahashev. Now, actually, it's not razor thin, but he wins a round against Mahashev, right? It's a close fight, closer fight than what Mahashev has had in the UFC. After that for Sarukian, he goes in there. He beats Olivier Aben Mercier, who's now the PFL World Champion. He beats Davy Hamas by decision. He beats Matt Frivola. Ten takedowns in that fight for Sarukian. He knocks out Chris Yagos in the first round after that. And he's got the huge win where he you know, beats Joel Alvarez to a pulp on the ground, finishes him by TK on the second, big win for Sarukian. Now he's going to be taking on Demir Zmagulov, as Magulov, a guy who is undefeated in the UFC. He is undefeated, he's only got one professional loss, he's 24 and one, that one loss comes all the way back in 2015 on M1 Challenge. And the guy's been really good in the UFC so far. Now, I don't like the decision in his last one on the uh, Cater and uh, on an Emmett card on the Ismagilov and uh, when Ismagilov fought Guram Kuta Deladze, I thought Kuta Deladze won the fight. I thought Kuta Deladze did enough to get the nod and the decision with the scorecards in that one. I thought 1-3 Kuta Deladze, Demir Ismagilov got the second. It's fine. I'm not, you know, like, again, it's not a robbery by any stretch of the imagination. I just thought Kuta Deladze won. But there's no denying how good Ismagilov is. All right, is, Ismagulov is a good striker. He's a good grappler as well. You've seen that he has been able to go in there, get takedowns like he did against Rafael Alves. Right, is Magulov or is Magulov is able to do that to these guys? You look at the Thiago Moises fight, that fight doesn't really hit the mat all that much, but is, is Magulov gets stuffed in his takedowns, but he's still able to go in there, he's able to outstrike Moises. My thing about this though, with is Magulov going in here, and if he's not able to take down Armand Sarukiana, I think it's gonna be trouble for him on the feet. Because I really think Sarukian's got the power advantage, Sarukian's got the speed advantage, 
it, it will be a tougher fight for Ismagulov on the feet against Sarukyan if he's not able to take him down. And I don't think he's going to be able to take him down. Yes, Sarukyan was taken down by Mateus Gamrot. Mateus Gamrot is truly a top five, top six, top seven fighter. I know he just lost to Darius, but still, Gamrot's a true top guy in the weight class. Not many people are taking down Armand Sarukyan. Really, it's it's Gamrot, it's Mahashev. I don't think Ismagulov is going to be able to add his name to the list. So once Ismagulov becomes just a striker, I think Armand Sarukyan is going to be able to have his way on the feet. I think Sarukyan has so much more power than Ismagulov. I think his striking keeps on getting better as his career has progressed on. And now you get him to this fight with Ismagulov. He's a minus 170 favorite. I think Sarukyan is able to win. I don't know if he's got the power for, say, to knock out Ismagulov and put him down and finish him. But, I mean, man, this is just such an incredible fight. you got an 18-3 fighter in Sarukyan taking on a 24-1 fighter in Ismagulov. And it's not even the main event. It's a tremendous fight. But give me Armand Sarukyan. Give me Armenian zone Armand Sarukyan to win this fight get back in the wind column after that Mateus Gamrot fight. I think he's going to go in there. I think he'll he'll beat Ismugulov by decision. I really love the fight, but give me again, Armand Sarukyan to win by unanimous decision. Main event time, we have got the killer gorilla, Jared Cannonier coming off his title loss to Israel Adesanya, taking on Sean Strickland, who is coming off his number one contender's fight loss uh, against the current champion now in Alex Pereira. Um, so originally this fight was supposed to take, take place two months ago. Um, it was supposed to be um, a couple months ago, Sean Strickland versus Cannonier in the main event. Fight never happened. I'm glad for Sean Strickland's case that that's not happening anymore. Because considering Strickland just got knocked out cold five months ago. Five months ago now, like, again, that's fine. Five months. But three, uh, that I wouldn't have liked Strickland's chances fighting Cannonier two months ago. Now, I think it's a lot different. I think Sean's got a re really good chance to win the fight. And I think it's, a, you know, a very fair and well-balanced fight now between him and Cannonier. Um, you know, Sean's a good striker. We know that. Sean Strickland's a good fighter, but he's an interesting striker. Now, when we talk about his fight against Alex Pereira, and now Pereira is saying some stuff about, oh, he was scared of Sean Strickland going into that fight. Really? Like, really you were scared of Sean Strickland? I don't know. I mean, the guy's a psychopath. There's no, no other way to put it. But um, Sean, you know, the Pereira fight, the fight went exactly how I, how I thought it was going to go. Now, that's not to pat myself on the back, but I said exactly that's how that fight was going to go. Strickland was not going to... In, was not going to be willing to engage in wrestling. He wanted to go out there and prove that, okay, I'm some, I'm this big macho guy and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to out kickbox Alex Pereira, one of the greatest kickboxers really that Glory's ever seen. And, you know, he, we're not kickboxing, really just outbox him. He runs right into a left hook by Pereira. Pereira knocks him out. That's it for Sean Strickland on that night. And that really sucks for Strickland because when you look at his run before the Pereira fight, the huge win streak for the guy, I mean, he beats Noreen Taleb, he beats Jack Marshman, but really, at, you know, post motorcycle accident, Sean Strickland, he beats Jack Marshman, he knocks out Brendan Allen, he beats Christoph Jocko, he beats Uriah Hall in a main event, he beats Jack Hermanson in a main event. He's been looking really good, his striking has been on point. It's just, you know, it, it just happens in that damn Pereira fight, he walks in there with his hands down, says, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna block any of these punches, I'm just gonna shoulder roll, I'm just gonna block him with my head. No, he showed zero head movement, he got knocked the out. I mean, like, it was not great out of Sean Strickland. Now he gets Jared Cannonier, who is another power puncher. Cannonier is going to throw hard, but he's not the same level of fighter that Alex Pereira is. Sean Strickland will be able to get out the way of some of these big shots that Jared Cannonier will throw. Not to, the, you know, if he fights, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not saying he's going to do this, and I'm not saying he should do this, but if he fights the way he fought Alex Pereira, like he fights Jared Cannonier, it's not going to be, you know, an, an automatic death sentence like the Pereira fight was, right? He can still fight, he can still adapt to Jared Cannonier if he somehow, if, if he doesn't, you know, pick up on that. Like, I think he's going to fight this fight smarter, but if you, even if he does fight this fight like he did Pereira, Cannonier is not as quick as Pereira is. He doesn't have the power Pereira is. Pereira has, and Strickland might be able to adapt more to it. I don't think it's gonna happen though. I mean, in, in, let's talk about the killer, gor killer gorilla. Oh my goodness, it's getting late. Um, and Jared Cannonier recording this after the Blakovich Ankalaev card. But um, Cannonier, you know, loses Israel Adesanya. He loses by decision. It's a typical Izzy fight when he doesn't feel like his his opponent's all that great, right? When he doesn't feel danger, that's what he will do to him. He will stay on the outside, he'll kick him, you know, use his leg kicks. He beat Jared Cannonier pretty soundedly. Um, Jared's got a fight against Derek Brunson before that, which I think is huge, really, because yes, he does beat Brunson, he does beat him in the second round. Brunson tires very quickly in that fight. But don't forget the first round. Derek Brunson knocks down Jared Cannonier. Derek Brunson is out striking Jared Cannonier. If that happens to Sean, or if that happens when Jared Cannonier is fighting Sean Strickland, Right? I mean, Sean Strickland can go out there 
and he can, I mean, he might have the advantage, a clear advantage, you know, striking against the killer gorilla. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that is very, very plausible in this fight. It's a, it's a thing that can happen. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think Jared's good, but really when you look at the Brunson fight and then you look at the Kelvin Gaslam fight, Gaslam wins rounds against Cannoneer. Again, Cannoneer is a good fighter, but is he really the number two middleweight in the world right now? Come on. Or is he number three? Now? He better be number three now. I don't think the yeah, I don't think the poster's updated because Adesanya, of course, falls, and then he's still got to be below Robert Whitaker. Because when you talk about the Robert Whitaker fight against Jared Cannonier, again, Cannonier has his moments, but Whitaker outstrikes him. Again, I'm not denying how good of a fighter Jared Cannonier is. He's a very good fighter. He's got a lot of power. But I feel like stylistically, this fight's this fight is hell for him stylistically. Because I think again, Sean's gonna be in his face. Sean's not gonna back down. You know, you know he's not gonna back down considering his last fight. I just think it's going to be tough for Jared. I think, again, Cannonier, I think, has got to get a knockout to win this fight because I don't think he will be able to outstrike Sean Strickland for 25 minutes. But again, the knockout will probably present itself. Let's be honest, it's going to present itself because of the way Sean fights, right? And because of the way Sean's last fight did go. Again, I think his chin is healed at this point, but you never know. Again, both these guys last fought on the same exact venue, the same exact night. Is that where Izzy won? Pereira won. Obviously, those two guys fought later in November. But right, I mean, man. I think Sean Strickland wins. I'm going to take Sean Strickland. I think Strickland wins by decision. Um, and again, this breakdown is getting a little bit, um, I mean, I am getting tired. So my apologies if this breakdown is not in as in depth as the Bobby Green was, as the Bobby Green one was and some of the others. But I think Sean does win. I think Strickland's striking does come into play. Obviously, I mean, it's going to have to. I don't think you're going to see much wrestling involved in this fight, if at all. I don't think there will be any wrestling. Um, but I think Sean, again, I think Sean's the better boxer. And obviously, power-wise, no. Strickland's not, doesn't have the power Jared Cannonier does have. But I think Sean will be able to technically outstrike um, Jared Cannonier in this fight. I think Cannonier is going to get stuck in hunting for the knockout and just throwing the big shots because Sean is having all that success throwing his straights against Jared. I think Jared's going to become, you know, going to have to throw these winging shots because, you know, Strickland will be beating him to the punch a lot in this fight. I think that's just how this fight's going to go. You know, Strickland is the favorite in this one. You got him right now at minus 115. You got Cannonier at minus 105. Again, an incredibly close fight on the odds, but I think Strickland's the better striker. I think Sean Strickland's going to win. Again, unless Cannonier is able to knock out Sean Strickland, which is a very plausible thing, it can happen. And it can happen very early. And it can happen, you know, real quick. I think Strickland's going to stay in there. I think he will eat some big power shots from Jared Cannonier. I think it's going to be a pretty big thing that, hey, that's just the power Alex Pereira had, right? I think Strickland's going to be able to eat some of the damage that Cannonier is going to throw back his way. I think Sean Strickland's going to be able to stay in the fight. I'm going to take Sean Strickland to beat Jared Cannonier in the main event, and I think he'll get it done by unanimous decision. He'll probably say some crazy stuff after the fight as well, but give me Strickland by decision over the Killer Gorilla and Jared Cannonier. And folks, thank you all for watching our final UFC uh, Fight Night predictions here of 2022. We will be back next year in about, I don't know, three weeks time for Kelvin Gaslam and Nasruddin Imavov in the main event from the UFC Apex. And after that, hey, looks like we just signed on. Yes, Divas and Figueiredo, Brendan Moreno for in the co-main event, but now in the main event, Glover Teixeira, Jamal Hill for the light heavyweight championship in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, coming at you in about four weeks' time. That's going to be a great card in Brazil. UFC back in Brazil for the first time in, what, three years? And also, this is not the end of MMA content, at least this year, for the channel. We will be back in a couple weeks' time for Bellator versus Ryzen. That's coming at you on New Year's Eve. So, uh, in about two weeks time, we'll be making our video for that coming out, coming out and probably the day after Christmas, we'll have that video up. So be on the lookout for that folks. Thank y'all for watching though. If you've been watching UFC or here on the channel all year long. Thank you. It's been probably, yeah, it's been the best year of UFC, um, support here, I guess in the channel. So on a 2023, a lot more coming here with UFC love doing MMA content here on the channel. And of course we'll have the Bellator card coming at you in a couple weeks as well. So folks, thank you for watching. Make sure that subscribe button down below for more. Make sure you leave a like if you did enjoy the video. Give a thanks for watching and Mamba forever.